Thank you for listening to this week's message from New Tribe Church. We hope you are both inspired and encouraged. To stay connected with us throughout your week, be sure to visit our website, download our app, or find us on Facebook and Instagram simply by searching for New Tribe Church. Now, open your hearts to hear and receive all that God has in store for you. In the last several weeks, we've been doing that. We've taken a swing at looking at what we are as a church. We are blank church. We are what church? We are a Holy Spirit receiving church. We are a Holy Spirit baptized church. We are a Holy Spirit filled church. And today we're looking at this word. We are a Holy Spirit led church. Look at your person next to you and say, let the Holy Spirit lead you. Go ahead and encourage them today. Let the Holy Spirit lead you. And, and I want to, I want to make this, make this point that, um, that the Holy Spirit is not a topic of the church, but the church is a topic of the Holy Spirit. Does that make sense? The Holy Spirit in the Godhead, right? Father, Son, Holy Spirit has this, he has this assignment. He has this mission that he obviously is not going to, to give up on. And, and we're gonna look at some of the ways in which he leads us today, but, but, but it's not that some churches, you know, look more often at the topic of the Holy Spirit. I don't think that's the way we should approach it. But the church, what we're a part of, what we just celebrated, what we just, uh, just kind of explained a little bit, this is a topic of the Holy Spirit. The ch- Let me tell you what, you are on the heart of the Holy Spirit like, like you wouldn't believe. And in this church, and the churches in this city are on the heart of the Holy Spirit. You are the greatest topic of the Holy Spirit. And I know that may sound a little me-centric, but I'm gonna explain that in just a little bit. There's a mysterious aspect of God in the Holy Spirit, one that we don't quite have the corner on. Like, look at this, 1 Corinthians 4, 1, for example. Let me just give you this, for example. The Apostle Paul is writing to church, and he said, this is how one should regard us, as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. If you guys don't mind, pull that scripture up so they can see that. Because when we see this right here, we know that we're called to be servants of Christ, but that's easy, right? It's like serve people, it's like love people, it's it's go out and be forgiving as God and Christ forgave you. But look at that next one. We should also be considered stewards of the mysteries of God. God hasn't given us the corner on everything about God. How many know this is true? Uh, we don't have it all figured out. There's just some things about God that are not meant to be solved. And so we should not only be known as servants of Christ. Like we do this a lot in our faith, right? We're like, well, we're just called to be servants of Christ. Well, we're just called to be servants of Christ. Uh Uh-uh. You should be known also as a steward of the mysteries of God. Now that makes you either feel two ways, like, ooh, I don't know about that. Or, Or you're like, tell me more, right? If you wanna know more, say tell me more, right? Because there's, if it's a mystery, then it's not meant to be solved. It's just what it is. And this is the aspect of the Holy Spirit that we need to learn to trust. But as we steward these mysteries, what is it to steward something? We take great care in the mysterious aspects of God. We're not careless with it, you know? But, but it would be good to develop some phrases in your life like you can't put God in a box. Some things you just can't explain. It would be better for you to have a faith that you don't have a chapter and verse for everything than to just go ahead and decide if you can't find it in scripture, line for line, word for word, it didn't happen and it doesn't exist. Are you guys picking up what I'm throwing down? There's a mystery of God that sometimes all you can say is, it was God. How many of you had those moments? It was, it, it was God, right? A clue here, a discovery there, moments that mystify us, which we have little doctrine theology to explain. You just know it was, it was God. You know, a lot of people have asked us this question over the last four years. They asked us this question. Why did you choose to come to Mount Juliet? And when someone asked that question, my, my first thought is I just wanna tell them it was God. But people like details, right? You like details? And so, I just wanna share with you a couple things about how we got here. These were those, it was God moment, the mystery of God, how he reveals his plan, how he lays it out for you, how he talks to you. 
we began to pray about planting a church and we believed that God was calling us to go where the people are going. Makes sense, right? Like if you're gonna plant a church, like it, don't go where there's no people, like go where there's people going. And Nashville six years ago was ranked like 15th fastest growing city in America. It was like 100 people a day coming, moving to this area. It was a ridiculous amount of people. And I'm just curious by a show of hands, how many of you have not from here, but you are here now? Just lift your hands. I mean, you can see by the room, like it's crazy, right? It's wild that people are just moving here in droves. So we, we knew that God was calling us to one of the fastest growing cities in America, but then I wasn't so sure about Tennessee because I was like, Tennessee, I was like, you know, maybe West Coast is where God's calling us and just weird stuff would, <laughs> oh, you like that? Like West Coast, like. They need Jesus too, but everybody keeps moving from there to here, so it's kind of the same, right? Like, <laughs> I've met more people from California and Tennessee than I have in California. Like, it's the weirdest thing. And uh, so I was in the back seat of a car one time riding with some friends on the interstate in a place that I had been a million times, a route that I had been a million times. And, and I'm just, I'm in the back kind of twiddling my thumbs and I'm thinking, you ever just think like, God, what are your, what are your plans for me? Like, would you just show me a sign? And I, I lift my eyes up by that time and we pass one of those big green road signs that says Tennessee Road. This is in Kansas. And I'm like, why is that sign right there, Tennessee Road? And so, okay, so I start thinking about Tennessee a little bit more and Jennifer and I would go on these long prayer walks like by our house, this is in Kansas City. And, and we would walk for hours and hours and, and we would pray sometimes, you know, like, we would go a little bit giddy on, on God. You know what I mean? Like just cast your fleece on the water. It's like, so Lord, just show us a sign. And one time we're praying that, Lord, just if you would specifically, Lord, just show us that this is where you want us to go because we're gonna relocate our family and, and start again. And if you want us to go to Tennessee, God, just show us. And as we're walking, you know how you're on a walking trail and you kind of get behind someone who's slow. And uh, I look at the back of his shirt and it says John Severe. And I go, John Severe, that sounds so familiar. I get home and I look up the name John Severe. He's one of the founding fathers of the state of Tennessee. <laughs> and so at this point, this is where the Holy Spirit starts to grab you by the collar and say, do you hear what I am saying to you? Like, these are details. So we begin praying about Tennessee, okay, Nashville, fastest growing city there. And then through, a, someone said, how did you find out about Mount Juliet? And I'm just being honest, I Googled Nashville, growing suburbs, and Mount Juliet popped up. That's how I found it. I'm just, I'm just telling you. And I started praying. We started praying over this city. Okay, well, there's something about Mount Juliet. What do you want us to do? And so God said, seek a realtor. So we sought out a realtor because we were going to buy a home. We had never bought a home before. We're going to do this. We're going to put down roots. And we, we shoot out this email to this realtor. We're looking for a house in Mount Juliet, Tennessee. We think God might be calling us to move there. She sends us back an MLS listing. It has one home on it. Guess what the address was? 4025 Affirmed Drive. <laughs> now, to add to that caveat, my wife and I have a military background, so it was like affirmed, affirmed, like this is where you're supposed to go. I literally read it in my email on the iPad, and I just went, oh, and I threw my iPad into Jennifer's lap. I was like, read it. She's like, what? It says affirmed, <laughs> affirmed drive. And she goes, 4025. I was like, what's 4025? She said, Isaiah 4025. Watch this. Even you shall grow faint, but those who trust in the Lord shall mount up. <laughs> mount. <laughs> Juliet, Mount Juliet. Actually, the verse 4025 is to whom shall you compare me, says the Lord. Because he was like, now you see that this is me. But when you keep reading, that's when you see the word mount. And so you're just kind of like, okay, God. So then my son, our youngest son, we, we took a trip. We went hiking to the Smoky Mountains and on the way back, we were gonna stay in Mount Juliet just to see if we could feel, cause it's all about feeling, right? See if we could feel God in this city. And listen, as soon as we were coming from the Lebanon area under the Beckwith overpass, a car, a lot of you hold, heard the story, many of you have not, a car was flying past me about 150 miles per hour and went into a full flip. It probably flipped 30 times Roll, and I'm praying, I'm grabbing the steering wheel, I'm like, oh God, please no. Like it's just one of those panic moments. And this thing rolls off, lands on the shoulder, wheels up, I can't believe it. Wheels are blown off, glasses busted out. I'm the first on the scene. I take off running towards this car. I'm the first one there and this young 20 something guy falls out. And I just look at him like, oh my God, man. I was like, I don't know if you believe in God, but when your car started flipping, man, I was praying for you, you are right. And he's just like, 
you know, he's laying on the ground. He's conscious, but he's, which is a miracle, right? Because he was going so fast. And so I just put my hand on him. I've got 911 on the phone and I'm talking to 911 and I'm praying. Don't ask me how I did both, but I did it. And I'm just praying out loud. I got my hand on him and I just praying, God, thank you for saving this young man's life. Thank you that you showed him today, Lord, that you're protecting him, that you have a plan for him. And by that time, all these people start crowding up, you know, because there's all these people, the, the gawkers, they want to come and see what's going on. And as I'm praying on him, I'll never forget this. Like one guy runs up with a baseball cap on and he stops and takes his cap off and puts it over his heart, you know, like, he's like, is this guy praying his last rites? Like what's going on here? And then right about the time I said, amen, the EMTs were there. I stood up, I left and the next exit was Mount Juliet. Now I'm not saying God calls that to happen. I'm just saying the result of being in this city and that happening and me praying for that miraculous event that took place, I felt God. You guys hear what I'm saying? And so all the way back home, I could not get this city off my heart and my mind. It must be Mount Juliet, God, that you're calling us to. You see, I, I can't now, you say, well, what scriptures you got to back that up? I don't, I don't, it was God. God was just speaking, God was just showing, he was hinting, Some, sometimes it was subtle, sometimes it was not so subtle. And the, the final story I'll share with you is this, is that we finally decided, we met with our leadership, they laid hands on us just like this. They said, okay, we're gonna send you uh, to Mount Juliet. And my lead pastor said, well, do you guys have somewhere to live? I was like, no. He's like, well, you better go down there and find somewhere to live. And I was like, that's a great idea. So, so we had been going back and forth with this realtor and uh, we had three houses to look at. We drove from Kansas City, we had two days, actually one day, we drove down on Friday, we had Saturday to look, we had to go back. We drove down, we had three houses to look, look at. How about this is what happened. On the way down here, two of those houses sold. Welcome to Nashville, right? And so we began looking on Zillow, which the realtor was like, don't do that. But I, I did anyways. And, and I found a house. At 5009 Porter Heard Drive, and, and, and it wasn't even listed. It just said, hey, here's my number if you're interested for sale by owner. I told my realtor, I was like, hey, I know we lost two houses and the one you have picked out for us, we don't wanna go see that one anymore. Uh, we wanna go see this one on Zillow. And she's like, I don't know, that's usually not the way things go. And I was like, I just had a feeling about it. Cause it's all about feeling, right? Like, and, and so we went to this house and as soon as we pulled in the driveway, Jennifer's like, this is the one, this is the one. And we start walking around with the homeowner, the realtor. The realtor's like, don't act too excited. Don't show emotion. You know, don't tell them your story. And we're there for like five minutes and we're like, we just gotta tell you guys honestly, we believe God's called us here to plant a church. And <laughs> the realtor's like, you know. And he says to me, he goes, wow, that's crazy. He goes, the original owner of this house was a pastor. He lived here for 17 years. And I began to look around that room and I was like, the Bible study happened over there and the sermon prep happened over there. And I looked in the back and I imagined, you know, small groups of us gathering in that home. We made an offer, it was $10,000 under what they had pre previously been offered. Uh, they accepted it. We had a house in less than 24 hours that we found on Zillow. Praise God. So how did you, you know, people, so people like they quiz you, like how did, how did you know God was calling you to Mount Juliet? I, I, unless I tell you all those stories, all I can do is look at you and say, it was God. We're not just servants of Christ, we're stewards of the mysteries of God. God speaks, God nudges, he gives you hints, he gives you, he gives you clues. Not only are you clueless, you're, you're also not cueless because God is like giving you cues and, and giving you clues. Now, there's a way that we can learn to trust his leadership because we're not just following after some, you know, move of the wind aimlessly. You know, we need to make our plans, by the way. Look at Proverbs 16, nine. We can make our plans, we, we, we should, but the Lord determines our steps. Let me say this for the followers of Jesus, but the Holy Spirit determines our steps. You see, you go ahead and make your plans, and God will ever so gently nudge you, and he puts you in the right direction, and he will reveal to you the steps that he has determined for you. See, we get it wrong sometimes about our faith. And I want you to stay engaged with me here because there's a lot to unpack. Like people will say things like, oh, I'm just working through some things right now in my faith, which is so wrong, right? It's so against scripture. I wanna help you this morning. Look at this. We don't work out our faith alone. We walk out our faith with God. We, by the way, we and with are two of the most important words in understanding what it means to be the church we and with. On the other hand, work and alone 
are two words that can get us in trouble in the church. Here's the thing, we need God and we need each other. We don't work out our faith alone. If you've been in that place and you're in a rut, you're like, I'm just trying to work out some things with God. You're not meant to do it alone, but to walk with God. Walk out your faith with him. And, and what is it with all this walking? Well, the, the walking is actually good news. And here's why, because we're not the walking dead, aimlessly walking around, uh, you know, it's like, although some of you may feel like that sometimes. We are a Holy Spirit led church. Say it with me. We are a Holy Spirit led church. Look at John 16. We've been looking a lot at Jesus in his last days with his disciples before ascending. And he said to them at one time, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. But when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all, somebody say all, into all the truth. So let me just ask you a question. When does the spirit of truth come? Let me, let me share this with you. When you believe, when you receive, when you ask. Pastor Michael talked about last week, how much more will the Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Here's what I want you to understand, that the Holy Spirit's presence in your life is not limited to a past, present, or future experience. God's presence is, is what? It just is. The Spirit of God cannot be measured. Well, I had much, this much then and I, compared to this much now. No man can say of God, well, I, I now have enough or I have arrived or I have no more need of God's presence than I already have. If you were to say that, hear what I'm saying, you would be the first one to solve the mystery of God. Did you hear what I just said? If you're like, well, I don't need any more of God. I've got all God that I need. You're the first one to say, I'm no longer a steward of the mystery because I've solved the mystery. Don't hang out with people like that because we're all stewards of the mystery. You say, how can you say that, that the spirit of God cannot be measured? I didn't. John the Baptist actually prophesied this about Jesus. Look at John three, verse 33. For Jesus gives the spirit without measure. You know what that means? You can't measure it. <laughs> you, you, can't, you, you can't figure out how much I have, how much I need, or how much I lack. You can only receive, come on. You can only be baptized, come on. You can only be filled, you can only be led, but you cannot measure the spirit of God. Come on, I, I know that we all love Amazon, but, but you can't put God in a box. Listen to this, maybe this will help you today. Let me just talk to the saved people in the room. When you are saved, you receive all that you need, but not all that's available. This is so important. And I would say right here that this would be a, a theological point that we as a church body would hang our hat on. Of course you received all you need for salvation. You're not getting in heaven without the spirit of God. Newsflash, you don't have it in you to get in. <laughs> this is why the father sent his son into the world, right? To save you and to get heaven in you. And you got all you need, but how many know there's more available? Why? Because the spirit of God cannot be measured. Bottom line, there's more to be discovered about God. There's more to be revealed about God. Watch this, stay with me. And there's more truth about God that you've yet to discover. You say, how can you say that? I didn't, Jesus did. Did you miss it? John 16, 13, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all. Somebody say all, all the truth, all the truth. I thought the truth is all you need. No, all the truth is all you need. I just want you to consider this. If Jesus walked through those doors right there and he came and he stood in the room and he said, I would like everyone here who knows the truth to stand up. Hopefully all of us or most of us would stand up. Like, I know the truth, we could all stand up. But then if he were to say, now, which one of you knows all the truth, please remain standing. I will be the first to sit down. Anybody with me? And hopefully you would too. What I'm getting at is there are some things about God that I believe to be true, that I know to be true, but the Holy Spirit shows me all things 
about God that are true. Let me just give you some practical examples. Like, like growing up, I've always believed there was a God. I never had a problem with that. Had some weird ideas about God. Anybody else? But I always believed there was a God. The Holy Spirit has shown me that God is a father. I've always known I was a sinner. No one ever had to tell, explain to me that you're a sinner. I was like, oh, I get that part. I always knew I was a sinner, but the Holy Spirit has shown me that I'm a son. Are you seeing this pattern? You see, knowing the truth makes a difference, but knowing all the truth makes all the difference. And there's only one who can help you with this problem, church, and his name is the Holy Spirit. Look at John 16, 13 again. He will guide you into all the truth. Just quickly, that word there for guide is from this Greek word, hadegos, which is to lead, it's to teach, it's to show the way. Okay, so, so I'm looking at this and I'm like, all right, what's the big deal then? What's the big deal where the Holy Spirit is getting all this information that I need to know to walk out my faith? I mean, can I just Google it? No, you can't Google it. Where is he getting all of this information that you need? Look at verse 13, the rest of the verse. Jesus said, he will not speak on his own, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will, he will disclose to you what is to come. And I was thinking this week, like, I don't know if you realize this or not, but not only is there a, a place in heaven, there's, there's a line in the book, book of life that is made for your name, but there is a real time conversation happening at this very moment in heaven about you, what you are destined for. Come on, the steps it will take to get you there. And, and this is beautiful and, and a plan for helping you complete the good works that God has prepared in advance for you to do. It's going on in real time. And the Holy Spirit has access to a conversation between the Father and the Son that you just don't have access to. But if you will trust his leadership, learn how to hear from him, not only just hear what he's saying, but watch for those signs and feel those nudges from time to time, you will begin to see that actively he is revealing to you the steps that God has laid out for your life. Say amen if you believe that. If you will allow him to, he will even disclose to you what's to come in your life. And here's the bonus, watch this, the rest of the verse, verse 14. Jesus said, when he's doing all this, he will glorify me, for he will take from mine and he will disclose it to you. This is a beautiful piece of scripture, church. I hope you get this. Because um, I know there's a lot of really, really smart people in here, like way more intelligent than me. And I know a lot of you, like you're, you're educated, you're disciplined, you're seasoned in the things of God. And maybe you got all this figured out, but is there anyone in this room today who wants to hear from God? do his will, and for Jesus to get the glory for it in the meantime. Well, then here's how you do it. Trust the Holy Spirit to lead you. <laughs> it's his assignment. It brings him great joy to do it. He will guide you. So the question is, how does he guide? How does he lead? Now, this is the fun part. If you're taking notes, write this down. The Holy Spirit leads with a sword. The Holy Spirit leads with the sword. And if this is anything, it's just proof that God is cool, that he's awesome. Aren't you glad it doesn't say Holy Spirit leads with a wand? <laughs> right? <laughs> with a sword. <laughs> okay, I'm paying attention now. Like, and, and I just want you to imagine this scene, right? Apocalyptic, barren land. You're in a, you're in a barren city. Maybe like the book of Eli. Great movie if you haven't seen it. Just don't watch it with your kids. Yeah. I, I gave you that disclaimer. Now, don't blame me later if you turn that on in, there, in the room. But I want you to imagine this apocalyptic scene. You're there. You're in this barren city. You're hungry. You're tired. You're desperate for shelter. And, and the road ahead looks really scary. And I want you to imagine in this scene, someone standing there looking just as desperate and helpless as you with their empty hands. And they're like, hey, hey, follow me. I, I think it's this way. All right, now cut away from that scene. You're there again, now go back to it. But this time you see someone standing fearless, sword in hand, turns to you and says, follow me, I will show you the way. Now who are you gonna follow? 
The one looking as desperate and empty handed as you or the one who is standing there ready to lead you with the sword. That is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit leads with a sword. Now, now it's not a medieval type of sword, like too heavy to swing, you know, like you drag on the ground and you try to swing, but it's really more of an ancient assassin-like dagger, like stealth, swift, precise, like he doesn't miss. And just so we know what we're talking about here, Ephesians 6, 17, the sword of the spirit is the word of God. So he leads with the sword, this assassin-like dagger and, and the sword, his sword is the word of God. Now I'm going somewhere with this right now. So just stay with me, but let's talk about this sword a little bit. Here's the Greek word for this word sword, makaira, which is, <laughs> this is gonna change your view of the Holy Spirit. He's walking around leading with the sword, which is the word of God. And then this is probably defined as a slaughter knife, a short sword or dagger mainly used for stabbing, killing animals, cutting up flesh. Figuratively, an instrument for exacting retribution. <laughs> okay, does anyone's mind just expand a little bit on the sword that he's leading with? And it brings some new understanding to a familiar passage that a lot of us know, Hebrews 4.12, what does it say? For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, even penetrating as far as the division of soul and spirit, both joints and marrow, able to judge the thoughts and the attentions of the heart. So I wanna get right to this explanation. Why is it that the Holy Spirit leads with the sword? Here's your answer. You can't always trust the thoughts and intentions of your heart. You need a guide with the Holy Spirit. Did you hear what I just said? You can't, oh, I don't know about you, but I can't trust the thoughts and the intentions of my heart. And there are a lot of people right now, you gotta stay with me. Look, if you call yourself among the faithful right now, there are a lot of people right now, they are turning away from what it really means to follow Jesus. Let me tell you why. They've got another leader and it's not the Holy Spirit. They got another leader and he's not walking around with the sword. They're trusting in something else and it's all about what they're feeling or what seems right. And they're not letting anyone or any part of God come and cut and prod. Oh, you didn't know God wanted to cut you to little bitty pieces, tenderize your heart so that you could receive the truth. The Holy Spirit leads with a sword. But what about our thought? Oh, well just, you know, let's think good thoughts. Let's have great intentions. Good thoughts and great intentions get people killed. And if you're leaning on your own good thoughts and your own intentions, you're not trusting the leadership of the Holy Spirit who will take God's word and will put it next to your heart and say, I know how you're feeling, but I want you to see what I'm saying. And that's where the work begins. There are too many of us come on, in the church, trying to work this thing out alone. Ah, I'm just working through some things with God right now. Like the Bible's kind of my hang up. I got some real big questions. And I'm like, who are you gonna ask? <laughs> like, are you gonna ask someone else who's standing there just as desperate as you are with empty hands? Or are you gonna ask the one who is standing there with a sword in hand, ready to lead and show you the way? Ready to speak to you. God's word, God's heart. God's truth, God's will, which will sometimes split your thoughts and intentions right in half. You see, when we trust with those who have no sword, we get nowhere. And I know, I know this about myself, and this is my confession, I hope some of you can relate, like God knows me too well to leave me alone with the thoughts and intentions of my heart. So he has provided for me a leader with a sword, and his name is the Holy Spirit. I, wanna, I want you to, invite the Holy Spirit to your next quiet time. I learned a couple of years ago never to open up my Bible without inviting the Holy Spirit to come and to help me. I'm not educated enough. I've got the degrees. I've read the books, lots of them. But I'm not gonna take out his sword and pretend like I know how to use it without him showing me how. And I wanna tell you, it doesn't matter. Listen, I have seen children open up the Bible for the first time and read it and get deeper revelation than someone who's been staring at it for 50 years. What was the difference? Holy Spirit. <laughs> like, I, 
I, I know there's parts of this message where you're like, oh, daggers and swords and people getting cut up and apocalyptic scenes, what's going on here, right? Like, but, but I, want you to, I want you to invite the Holy Spirit to your next quiet time. Let me show you something. He will comfort you and at the same time, he will cut you to pieces. Filleting your heart until it is tender enough to receive again all, somebody say all, all that God has for you. He will guide you into all the truth. I have comments that I wanna make right now about our obsession with the truth. We just need to stand for the truth. We need to preach the truth. No, we need the Holy Spirit to guide us into all the truth. Because the moment we start thinking that we have arrived, we have already fallen 10 steps behind him. He's the only one that can lead the way. And when he leads, he leads with a sword. Invite him into that quiet time. He will dash you, he will cut you, he will comfort you, but he will guide you into all truth. He will speak whatever he hears. He will disclose to you what is to come, but he will also pierce your calloused heart and say, now follow me, I wanna show you the way. How often we forget, look at Galatians 5, 24, that those who belong to Christ have been crucified, right? We crucified the flesh with its passions and its desires. And this next part's amazing. Therefore, if we live by the Spirit, let's follow the Spirit as well. This is one of those, like, if, I'm, if this is a road sign and I'm reading this, I kind of pump the brakes and I back up and I read the last part again. Wait, what? If we live by the Spirit, let's follow the Spirit as well. And why is that so amazing? Here's why, because it implies that somehow we can live by the Spirit and not follow Him. I wanna do, how many of you can relate? I'll go first. That's it, no one else is gonna confess with me? Oh, I've lived by the Spirit and not followed Him. It reminds me of of, of people who've said things like this, like they continue to find themselves in trouble. And they say, man, God has saved my life so many times. And there's nothing wrong with that, right? Like, like, like praise God that he saved your life so many times. I can relate, but please hear me. The Holy Spirit wants more than to just keep you alive, friend. He wants you to thrive. And so if you live by him, follow him as well. And that's why I hit the brakes on this last line here, because that's amazing to me that I can live by him and somehow choose not to follow him. So if you're living by him and not following him and you don't want to go back to the places where you were, look, just this time around, just stay next to him. And you say, well, what do I have to do? It's not that complicated. Watch this. Just walk. Look at verse 16. Walk by the spirit. Just walk. Just walk. Don't panic. Just walk. There's some guys, and I'm gonna to speak to the men. I know it's Mother's Day. But there's some men in this room. Let me just, hear, hear my heart right here. If you would just learn to walk, God would give you so much more revelation than you have. You know when a stumbling block gets you? When you're running. You know when you see it? When you're walking. Oh. I went to a pastor's retreat uh, the week before last, and was amazing. I was with pastors from all over the country and these pastors had really taken a beating in 2020. It's kind of been hard for like leadership in general, but especially, you know, pastors. And this one pastor, man, he's like, he's so fiery and like, he's just always pumped up. He's talking, he's talking, he's talking. And they send us out one day and they're like, hey, we just want you to go out in nature and we want you just to try to connect with God. Like, I will tell you this, I got on a paddleboard, like this little we were kind of an inland shore area. Got on a paddleboard, saw some dolphins. I was like, whoa, dolphins. That was cool. And this one guy, you know, so I told my dolphin story. I was fishing. I was boating next to some alligators. So I was telling my story about, about the dolphins and about the alligators. And when it was his turn to share, he was like, man, I, I was out in the woods. And he said, God just said, slow down. And I, everybody was like, what did you see? He's like, man, I saw a caterpillar. But then like, you know, this, guy, this guy's like a million miles an hour. Boom, 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 boom. And he said, God spoke to me. He said, you know what? God put that caterpillar there. And he said, if I wouldn't have slowed down to walk, I never would have seen it. There's some men in this room right now and you're living 90 miles to nothing. And a Bible study, a prayer group, 
The next men's event is not the answer for you. The answer for you is to walk with God. Look at this. Walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Did you see that? Just walk and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. And I'll tell you why you will not, because he will cut you if you're walking with him. For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. These two are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. What does that mean? I don't have to look for a list of rules. I don't have to get all these things right. I don't have to make sure I'm doing all this versus all this. Let me just break this down. I'll give you two points here. Living spirit led is not about knowing what you should or should not do because of your religion for God. It's not about that. Here's what it's about. Living spirit led is about doing what you ought to do because of your relationship with God. Now, just before we close this message last week, in Pastor Michael's message, he talked about the fruit of the Spirit. It was a great message, awesome prayer by, by his little Everly at the end. But if we're gonna conclude this season of messages today, we need to look at what rots the fruit, just briefly, all right? Somebody say, I'm ready. Because we get weird when we start talking about sin in the church. It's like you don't talk about that anymore. But how many know it's still there? Come on, how many know it's still around? How many know there's still stuff in our life that rots the fruit God has for us? So, before we, I mean, how many of you love a good, juicy, fleshy peach in the summer? Those little stands on the way down to Florida, I know you're going this year, you're gonna see them. You're gonna go buy a little basket of peaches. You're gonna be like, this is the best peach I've ever had in my life. But really it's just summer again and you're eating a peach <laughs> once a year. So now everybody likes that, right? I got a big juicy peach. How many like it when there's a worm in there? All right, so exactly, right? Like, so, so what we're about to look at, like these are the worms. Look at this. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident which are sexual immorality, impurity, indecent behavior, idolatry, witchcraft, hostilities, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these of which I forewarns you that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, I know when I read that, that it, it messes with some of you. But I gotta tell you, these are the worms that rot the fruit. And so here's what we've learned about the Holy Spirit so far. He wants to cut you and deworm you. <laughs> How many still want it to be Holy Spirit-led church? Come on, say it with me. We are a Holy Spirit-led church. He knows the worms that are going on in your life. I don't have time to go through and define all of these. Look, he's given you conviction in regard to sin, righteousness, and judgment. I don't have to go and unpack all this stuff. He knows what parasitic worms are crawling around in your heart. And he wants to deworm you. You're like, that's gross. I'm like, I know. <laughs> Look at that last verse again. Those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Please take your religious cap off right now. Let me tell you what this is saying. We cannot receive all God wants for us in the spirit if we practice only what we want in the flesh. Let me say that again. You guys pull it up there so you can see it. We can't receive all. Somebody say all. He will guide you into what truth? All the truth. We can't receive all God wants for us in the spirit if we practice only what we want in the flesh. Now, as we close today, I'm gonna have Scott come forward. But even yet still, there remains a mystery. Look at Galatians 5.25 again, because it says if we live by the Spirit, well, let's follow the Spirit as well. And isn't this the grace of God just screaming at us? Because it's showing us this, we can just live in the grace of God, right? And a lot of people are there, and I think it's great. Like, well, I'm just living in the grace of God. I'm just living in the grace of God. You can live in the grace of God and live by the Spirit and not follow Him. 
How many are thankful for that grace? Or we can live in the grace and the truth about God and live by the Spirit and follow him as well. And then leading of the Holy Spirit will bring you into all that God desires for you. Let me tell you that the plans he has for you are good to prosper you and not to harm you. A plan for a hope and a future. He's prepared good works in advance for you to do on his timeline, on his agenda. You can make your plans all you want, but he's determining your steps. And how many of you right now, he's saying, you need to go this way. You need to go that way. It's a great plan you've got, but it's not the plan I have for you. And he's poking you with that little dagger, trying to cut away at some parasitic worms in your life. Don't resist him, church. Trust him. Yeah. Come on, if we're going to praise him, trust him. I feel like, I feel like, and I'm, I'm responsible for that. I feel like we have not been taught about the Holy Spirit in the right order. Yeah, he's a comforter. He's a comforter because he cuts you up with the word of God. He's like, they're gonna need some healing after I deal with these worms. Are you hearing me? He's a helper because you got issues. He's an advocate for you because you're, you're the first one to give up on yourself. And he's the first one that, he's your advocate. It's like, well, you got this, you can do this. Let me cut away some of that flesh. Let me get rid of some of those things that are rotting fruit that God has for you. Looking at you when you're all alone and you're feeling condemned and guilty. He's like, that kind of condemnation, that doesn't come, to, there's no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. And he's just working you over. This is the Holy Spirit. And I wanna tell you that as you grow in trusting him, don't make this mistake. Obviously they were making it then because as you grow in trusting the leadership of the Holy Spirit more, you're gonna begin seeing all that stuff that used to rot the fruit and be like, man, I can't ever believe that I let that get a hold of me. And then you're gonna see friends and family and you're gonna see the worms that are still rotting that fruit in their lives. Let me tell you, look at this next verse here, Galatians 5, 25. As you're growing, let us not become boastful. Oh, did you see that? Challenging one another. Spirit-led living is not seeing someone who's getting eaten up by the worms and say, oh, when I had a little too much drink last night, I trust the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Wives to their husbands, oh, that outburst of anger. Not trusting the Holy Spirit, are you? Wait, remember what a pastor said about being Holy Spirit-led, outburst of anger, that's a rotting worm. <laughs> it's not what we're doing, church. You guys hear me? I wanna be honest with you. I don't care how long you've been following Jesus, how long you've been trusting the Holy Spirit, there are still some parasitic worms that work in your own life. And there's only one with a dagger who can cut away at those worms, can bring health to you. So as you're growing in your faith, be gracious with others. I'm gonna tell you that I'm, I'm learning this. Be gracious with others. Don't be challenging one another. I'm guilty of that. Like, I wanna challenge you to be a real man of God. Sound like Mr. T or something. What is that about? <laughs> Church, if we get this right, this city will be transformed Amen. Amen. Yes. because you will be transformed. You haven't always walked in all the truth. I know you know a lot of it, but you don't know all of it. But as we learn to trust him, look at Romans 8, 14, for all, somebody say all. For all being led, those who are being led, those who are doing it right, those who are doing it wrong, for all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons and daughters of God. Let me tell you something, this is my final point right here. This side of heaven, this is about leadership. This is about leadership of the Holy Spirit. This side of heaven, you will never meet a greater leader than the Holy Spirit. Did you hear what I just said? What I just said? Now here, here's, here's the caveat for you you will never meet a greater group of people than those who are led by him. Please tell me it's raining. You remember the opening story about how we got here? God just does things every now and then. I wrote this down right here at our closing. 
that I believe that we're supposed to welcome some home today and we're supposed to call others home. Because Holy Spirit is not here to fill the church. He's calling sons and daughters home. Will you stand with me? We just open your hands towards heaven. Look, I know you got Mother's Day lunch and you got things going on and you're worried about rain. But what if right now this was God's just last little effort to say, I want you to be received. I want you to receive this. I want you to be baptized in this. I want you to be filled in this. Come on. I want you to be led by this what? Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, we welcome you into this place. Even as this rain falls right now, what if, what if that were a sign from you? Come on. I see men of God right now being washed clean of their iniquity. Right now, I see parasitic worms. Evade, they are being evicted in your heart in the name of Jesus. Holy Spirit, get them right now. Just fill those hearts. Hearts that, are, that have been calloused are being softened right now by the dagger of the Holy Spirit. Women in here who have, who have been, we talked about this, you've been praying, you've been interceding for, for things. There are things on your heart that God has heard your cry. And don't quit doing that. Holy Spirit, fill those who are drained. Fill them up. You know what's great about this, this picture of rain as we get ready to close? I'm gonna ask Pastor Mike to come forward, but don't open your eyes just yet is that it saturates everything that it touches. And so as you leave here today and that rain hits you on the way out, let it remind you of the refreshing outpouring of his Holy Spirit. But don't just soak it all up. Trust him to lead you this week. We are a Holy Spirit-led church. We just stay there for a moment and just let us soak in this rain of his good presence.